Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. This is Richard Benuli. Today we have Guy Hasselman and Ira Harris. Guy is a macro strategist and former head of rate strategy at Scotia Capital. Ira is a hedge fund manager, global trader in foreign currencies, bonds, commodities, and equities for over 40 years. He was also a CME director from 1997 to 2003 and back on the board today. Welcome, Guy and Ira. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. It's great to be with you. Great. I thought we'd begin a discussion with what's a topic that's a lot on everybody's mind is U.S. yield curve inversion and the deepening of that. Uh, Why is this happening? What are the drivers? And importantly, do you see that yield curve changing perhaps and steepening anytime soon and under what conditions? Uh, Guy? Yeah, um, there's a lot of conversations now that the yield curve inversion is a function of uh, of the warning sign to a recession, and historically, there's there's some truth to that when it's persistent and long lasting. But what's not often discussed right now is the fact that the yield curve is being monumentally manipulated by global central banks. So it's hard to tell how much of it is a warning sign, uh, and I think there is some predictive power there. Germany's already in a recession. Um, uh, Korea, Japan, there's a lot of uh, pockets of, of serious economic weakness. But global central banks are hoarding $25 trillion worth of assets on their balance sheet. And so that creates all kinds of unintended consequences. Um, and it certainly distorts um, the shape of the yield curve. It distorts absolute Uh, yield levels, and then the sellers of those bonds have to go into other types of securities to replace the government bonds that they're selling to central banks. Uh, So there's a big distortion type of effect on that. But certainly an inverted yield curve is not good for for the banking system. Um, And I'll stop there. Ira, your thoughts? (laughs) <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly. And the most important part is, of course, is the manipulation and therefore the destruction of the single signaling mechanism of the bond markets. You know, it's they've broken it. And therefore, as you know, to paraphrase Colin Powell to uh, President Bush on, upon invading Iraq, if you break it, you own it. You know, it's a, a pottery barn. And they've broken it, so they own it, and yet they don't really want to own what they've done to it, and they look for other reasons. And now you have all these experts um, who are, and I use that term very loosely, um, who are all talking about the impact of of yield curves. But if you talk about yield curves without context, it's a meaningless discussion because uh, I don't know how old Guy is, but having lived through the Volcker and actually been a trader and uh, working in the business uh, during that time, uh, when Volcker forced an inversion of the yield curve, well, that was not like none other. And there was a purpose to that one. This one, I can't, the purpose is because the central banks have, have um, continued down a path that is just ridiculous. They've gone from providing liquidity and preventing a liquidation of the financial system, which was, I, I, I would agree that it was a necessary event, into being the all-encompassing um, uh, knowers and thus manipulators of, of the financial system. To, and, and it has caused this, and uh, well, well, we'll get, to, I, I, I'll stop there too. Well, yeah. I'll actually add on that if I can pile on to this monetary lunacy. Central banks are really falsifying reality. And this is really central bank strategy drift 
where they've gotten out of the business of central banking and into the business of trying to centrally plan. And like you said, when you break a country, you own it. Well, they're wrecking everything. And who are these unelected, unaccountable officials who are a bunch of PhDs who really don't know how the markets work? They're more of a textbook to assume that what they know is better than price discovery. Price discovery can happen through supply and demand and hundreds of millions of people trading stocks and bonds and other things, even determining the price of money and credit. And they're basically trying to centrally control and think that they know better than than the marketplace. And the unintended consequences, I mean, they're basing it on some Phillips curve uh, that they hide behind and the and their dual mandate. I mean, if it's really a dual mandate, give me a break. I mean, there was no economic case whatsoever for the recent great cut. It just shows you how they're, they've become politicized or they're really worrying about the equity market or the White House or something else. But it certainly wasn't within the realm of why the Fed was created in 1913 nor an economic justification for that rate cut. And you also see other unintended consequences as well, right, Guy, in terms of widening inequality, asset bubbles, uh, fueling indebtedness. Can you elaborate? And it's even worse than that. Uh, You're right. Um, Let's think about what they're doing. So they, they push the price of money, interest rates down to zero. It creates the fact that money is less than free now. It's almost that you're getting paid to be a debtor. That is completely unsustainable, and that is really dangerous. Um, But the corporations, and so there's a moral hazard issue. You're incentivized to be a debtor. You're incentivized to speculate. But who's getting punished are savers and pension funds and those that are trying to be prudent. Uh, And that type of moral hazard incentive is is extremely dangerous. Corporation, you know, we had a a debt bubble, uh, right? The 08 crisis was really a crisis of, of debt from interest rates that were too low for too long. And Fed policy since has lowered interest rates so that sovereign debt levels as a percent of GDP are far higher. The corporate bond market uh, is about two and a half to three times larger than it was in 2007. And it was all to try to support some type of real capital spending. But corporations didn't use the money for that because there's no visibility. Uh, And so they used the money to actually give the illusion of prosperity to buy back their shares, which is, or increase their dividends. And, um, and now you, it's made worse by the President Trump, who has really tied his reelection and his presidency to the level of the stock market. So he is really incentivized to try to keep it going. And what have we done in the 126th month of this real negative rates where GDP has been, you know, maybe slower than it should have been at one and a half to three, but the fiscal levers kind of opened up on top of it. It's sort of like what happened when, you know, things are going well, you should save for a rainy day. Instead, it was pedal to the metal. And 2020, we're going to have debt that's going to be growing even quicker because the fiscal deficit is going to be four and a half percent. And so there's a lot of unintended consequences of, of the Fed's determination to try to create 2% inflation. And one more thing, let me just add that 2% inflation, I do not know why that would be a good target. I mean, Greenspan defined stable prices as, quote, that state in which expected changes in the general price level do not effectively alter business and household decisions. Okay, so why do we need inflation to go up? It means that the purchasing power of your hard-earned money 
will be cut in half in 36 years. I'm not so sure why that's a really good objective. And again, it all comes back to this moral hazard. Ira, do you see similar unintended consequences? Uh, yeah, and, and, and it is it's the 2% target, which emanated from uh, Don Brash and uh, as the head of the Bank of uh, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, which New Zealand uh, is a, was in a far different situation, of course, as a, a fairly homogeneous country of what I'm not sure how how small the population. I can't say how big it is, but how small the population is. Um, it's ridiculous, and I think Greenspan's definition, uh, as Guy says, it was it was absolutely that was an operative definition. The two percent is really a joke. The Phillips curve, and I'm sorry, I've argued this for 40 years. It, the Phillips curve is dead in a globalized system where money flows freely because money is allowed to chase uh, low wages. And as long as you have that without any type of capital controls, capital wins. And capital will always be in search. And then, of course, you add in the adv advents in, in transportation, uh, you crush the unions. So the Phillips curve, which had relevance during the time of private sector unions, I'm not talking about public sectors, that's a whole different part of the discussion, but private sector unions have been decimated. And I was on the other side of that because I did a lot of uh, organization work back in the 70s um, in, in pushing for private sector unions, but those have been absolutely uh, destroyed. And as I, you know, when I'm out with Rick Santelli, I've made the quip several times. In fact, one time I'm actually going to wear a Nehru jacket because when Bernanke would talk Nehru, the non-accelerated inflation rate of employment, I would talk Nehru, meaning another billion Indians entering the global uh, labor market, driving wages ever lower. So tell me where the Phillips curve could possibly have any. But it's all, the 2% inflation is all about the fact that we live in a debt, the United States, especially in a debt-based economy, and so you want inflation because infl nothing nothing eases debt loads like inflation. So that's what we we resolved on. And when they compare it to Japan, it's such a flawed argument to me because the first, Japan, when Japan had fifty basis, don't forget they weren't zero; they were probably thirty, forty, fifty basis point ten-year uh, yields. They had deflation or disinflation of one and a half percent. So if I was a Japanese bondholder, I was still getting a real return of anywhere between one and two percent on my money. And lo and behold, 97 percent of the Japanese bond market at the time was held by domestic uh, bond bondholders between the pension funds and everything else. So those who talk about J Japan, I'm reading, I'm looking at a headline right now, Japanification of the economy. It's so badly flawed. And I, you know, I think guy is you know, 100%. And now they've gone down this path. And I'm going to end with this because the way that this is going to end, and it has to end, and, and I say this all the time, if you're an investor, forget if you're a trader. A trader, I understand, you buy uh, a negative yield bond because you hope to be able to sell it back to the ECB or somebody else who has to buy it. But if you buy anything in the U.S. more than two years out, I, I think you should. You need your head examined because if if the central bank is successful doing what it's doing, you're a major loser. And if they're not, You've got more things to worry about, and and if you're involved in this, you you cannot own this stuff. It makes zero sense. The curve, if the if the if interest rates were allowed to work, the curve would be steepening like it did. If we remember what happened after QE one, the curve really steepened out because everybody said, "Oh, look at what they're doing. They're pumping all this liquidity in," and then QE two also the curve steepened out. But then of course it wasn't allowed to. They slayed the quote-unquote bond vigilantes and the curve started to, to, to flatten. But this is all by the hand of the central banks, all by the hand of the central banks. And it's a global phenomenon. Yeah, I don't know how any fiduciary can justify saying that they're maximizing return per unit of risk. It's, it's lunacy. It's lunacy. And the 1970s, Phillips curve should have been debunked in the 1970s. 
when we had stagflation. Um, and that's the one risk right now that I think that people, um, and I'll give a little warning about what I'm concerned about, is that people think, you know, well, we're headed into a recession and deflation will fall that much faster. But if we fall into a recession because of this currency wars that seem to have propped up and this race to bottom and in interest rates to try to devalue a currency, if the cause of the recession is all of those countries trying to turn inward to be better on a relative basis, that I would define that as anti-globalization. Right? <clears throat> Technology and globalization over the last 30 years has really made it so we could trade with each other. You find your lowest cost producer, everybody wins. It's really done more to lift the human condition than anything in modern history. I mean, it's been truly exceptional. But if you have the anti-globalization trade, which is currency wars, tariffs, protectionism, and then all of a sudden some of those really optimized supply chains start to become disrupted and companies have to go to their second or their third producer of parts and goods and things like that, now, all of a sudden, you are talking about this slower growth, slower supply lines, uh, but higher prices. And you could end up in a situation that's a little bit like the 1970s. That would really put central banks into a double pickle. And certainly all these um, investors that have been chasing higher and higher asset prices. I mean, uh, Ira, you laid it out pretty well that the lunacy of it is that some of the people who are buying it are counting on a greater fool to be sell, to sell their their bond that has no value and a very high price. They're counting on the ability to sell it at an even higher price. And that's irresponsible as a portfolio manager or a fiduciary to be to be thinking along those lines. But I do worry about this anti-globalization impetus right now that could lead to significantly lower growth and a little bit higher inflation. I'm not saying that's my baseline, but I'm saying that is an extraordinary risk to the way portfolios, uh, you know, there's just too much dependence on central banks. That central bank put is alive and well, uh, but you're counting on bigger and bigger bubbles and the fact that these central banks can be successful um, in order to create bigger and bigger bubbles. And I think that's a pretty low um, probability. I, I, it's really, uh, you know, a phenomenal point because, first of all, I'm glad you bring up the currency wars because there's, I mean, everything we're talking about today, and then we, we get this piece from uh, Bill Dudley, the uh, ex-New uh, uh, York Fed president, who wrote this piece that was so scathing in its in its uh, substance that the Federal Reserve had to respond to it with a very open statement that they were not looking to politicize monetary policy. But when I read the doubly piece, and then I re reread it and read some of the you know what people are talking about, Bill Dudley makes a, a, a gigantic mistake because. You know, Richard, you and I have talked about this uh, many times that Donald Trump has trapped the Fed because as soon as J Jay Powell did his pivot back in, and, and I and I know a guy from reading some of your stuff, you know, uh, the, some of your writings, I won't call it stuff because that's to demean it and I'm not demeaning it whatsoever. It's quite good. Um, but when he did his pivot, he fell into Donald Trump's trap because as long as Donald Trump could rile the markets at any given time with tariffs, the Fed was forced to respond or at least not raise rates. So what Stanley Druckenmiller so beautifully talked about in December, which is, and I agreed with it well before that, but the double barrel approach, which was quantitative tightening coupled with raising interest rates was a disaster waiting to happen. And he was proved very prescient, but, um, but the fact that Powell pivoted so so well, Trump knew that he had him trapped, and you could see it over and over again. And we just saw it on Tuesday, on Thursday, Friday, when uh, Powell gives the speech, and then Trump 
the Chinese beat uh, Trump to the punch on it, but then Trump, of course, followed through with it in even a more caustic manner. Um, that then, then uh, of course, Dudley says today that the Fed shouldn't do anything. Well, I happen to agree with that, but not for the reasons that he states. But if the Fed goes into that mode right now where it says we're not we're not going to respond to Trump's terror terror threats and into the unknown abyss of what this is going to do, that plays into Trump's hand because and and Dudley doesn't make one mention of it. Because now, look, if that's the case, if Trump reads it that way, I think we're going to watch an, a real currency war take place because that's in the, in the purview of the White House. The Treasury Department has the control over the, the currency. And, and don't tell me how much they have in their stockpile, how much they can intervene. I've lived through the Plaza Accord. I've lived through the Louvre Accord. I've lived through uh, Bob Rubin's pivot in June of 1998 when the United States talked about a strong dollar policy only to intervene to weaken the yen at the behest of the Chinese anyway when Bill Clinton was going to China. We have all these things, and we could really get into some very ugly things because, because if Trump feels that the only thing he has left is the currency, I will tell you, watch out because we're going to go into a volatile period across all asset classes well beyond of everything that we've seen. What do you see of the potential of that scenario unfolding guy? Um, well, I think any time, yeah, I think that would be a disaster and um, you know, markets are already kind of being hit with a level of randomness. Uh, I use that word other than uncertainty. Markets don't like uncertainty, but, um, you know, we've priced in and out this kind of China thing so many times because the White House has been unpredictable. But I think we need to price out a lot of things. And one of the things we need to price out is the fact that the Federal Reserve can, you know, they keep saying we're the only game in town. I think really what they need to start saying is, we do not have the tools to be able to fix this or that. And I think the level of arrogance and hubris at the Fed in saying that um, has really reached an extreme. And I think they'd be better off kind of paring back. And when they do that, what it means is that this sort of underlying put that the market has come to realize that every time the market goes down, the White House will make it go back up or the Fed will make it go back up, I think it's just not true. I, I think that central banks, uh, I think that um, that they've become marginally less effective. I think they're already too hyperactive in what they've done. Uh, I think they don't want to be the market like uh, the Bank of Japan has become. You know, they haven't completely broken it yet, but they're on the verge of breaking and wrecking everything. And I don't think they really want to do that. At some point, free markets and price discovery need to come back. Uh, and I don't, and it's going to be a very difficult road to get there. There needs to be some Schumpeter type of, um, you know, creative destruction. And they've shown no ability whatsoever to allow that to happen. Um, and the, the more debt levels rise, the more difficult it becomes to normalize interest rates because then defaults will go up and it won't be like a Ponzi scheme where you can just refi just to pay off your existing debt. The amount of debt servicing costs will um, go right into, you know, if, if interest rates go up by 1%, I think that costs the United States government. 160 billion in, in added uh, interest expense, but the same thing happens to a corporation. It hits their bottom line pretty quickly. So that the effect is that the capital structure starts to price in um, more appropriate risk. It'll be less flat. Credit spreads will rise, junk bonds, uh, that all those triple B corporates, which is 54% of the whole corporate market will fall in the junk territory so a lot of junk bonds so um will will have to trade you know from being way above their economic value to probably um less than their true economic value 
Uh, I think markets will have a liquidity problem. And so we're talking about a truly significant correction that could hit both stocks and bonds. And portfolios are, are certainly not set up for such a scenario. Your, your thoughts, Ira? Well, <laughs> yes, those risk parity trades, which are the dominant trades on, on the huge hedge funds books, will blow up. That's their worst fare. And then you combine that with how much short volatility they've been in order to pick up a few extra percentage points um, in return. But there's so much there. I mean, guy is like just hit it out of the ballpark, as we would say, because all these points are dead right on. You know, and this low and, and interest it, rate means that, you know, we've come from this very long period of low volatility because that's what QE and low interest yeah. rates have really done. It's taken the risk out of the market. So vols have come way down. So as Ira is completely right, there's a lot of uh, short um short option strategies out there, but there's also a lot of uh, beta, or I'm sorry, leverage, uh, a ton of, of, of leverage. Um, you know, if your bond is only yielding 2%, what you do is you lever it three times so you can earn, you know, closer to, closer to 6%. So vols will, extreme, you know, go higher and the leverage needs to come back. Now it may not be on the, books of uh, the primary dealers and the banks, um, it's a lot safer there than it was in 2007. But the red type of regulation there has chased it into the shadow markets. And there's certainly plenty of leverage that, that needs to be unwound. And so the scenario is not good. No. And, and I'll tell you what, in a, in a, a classic example of what has really taken place. And, and again, the central banks want to, pretend that they don't bear responsibility for the election of people like Donald Trump. You know, there, there's many reasons you see it in Europe, especially. Um, and it's, and the, the media just don't want, doesn't want to talk about it, but it's, it's now coming to the, to the head anyway. In Germany, the banks and others are pushing back going there because they can't charge customers negative interest rates. There's an article or two this week, and actually over the weekend, uh, Jens Wiedemann came out and said he was opposed to fiscal stimulus after the previous week we had heard about all these people in Germany being in favor of fiscal stimulus. But what, because Mario Draghi, and I'm gonna use uh, what Guy had said, which is the only game in town, because that's what he has told everybody uh, for the, uh, to cover himself for this, ridiculous policy of, of perpetual QE. Yes, they ended it, but they're coming back to it and negative interest rates on top of it. But what this has led to is that they have uh, absolutely taken on the role of, of uh, fiscal authority because you know everybody talks about Germany stepping up to a, uh, a full program of fiscal stimulus you know, infrastructure. But I would argue for the German citizenry and there is such a thing because they vote domestically. They don't vote. Forget the European Parliament. It's a um, it's it, it's a it's a paper tiger, uh, except in its ability to set uh, regulations and make your life miserable. But as far as real governing, it's it's a paper tiger. But the fact that the Bundesbank and the German government has taken on the complete responsibility for the for the credit of the European Union, which is, of course, why interest rates are as low as they are, because if, if it wasn't backstopped by the Germans, European interest rates would be much higher. But if there is a default, then if the Germans are on the hook for a massive amount of money, which they are, whether it's Target 2 funding or any other way you want to measure it, that is that's about a trillion, tr Sorry, it's about a trillion dollars, I think, uh, Target 2, right. isn't it, Ira? Right, it is. And isn't that a fiscal stimulus? If you're pushing interest rates across the entire European Union, I mean, look at Italian rates on the tenure, we're down to 114 today. You have you have supplanted uh, German money for as a fiscal stimulus to every other country, and now they're on the hook for it. So if I'm in Germany, I'm going, wait a minute, I don't need a fiscal stimulus plan. 
I'm already the fiscal stimulus for the entire project. So, and which is creating political fallout that the the Draghi never talks about because you know that would mean that he'd have to attain responsibility. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, <laughs> you know, the, you're right. The Euro- European Union looks more like a European disunion at times. But earlier, I mentioned the Fed's st- strategy drift, and they've done sort of the same thing, right? They're acting more like a finance ministry. And if you go back to um, the original purpose, and um, by the way, there's a great of the Fed. And there's a great book. Roger Lowenstein wrote a book called America's Bank, which yeah, really goes in the great. Yeah, oh, it's a fabulous book. It just went yeah. into such great detail about the argument as to whether to um, to to have a central bank or not. And the arguments against are really being lived. They've 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 stripped it away from their original purpose. And their original purpose was to act as a backstop for banks to prevent bank runs, like you saw in 1907, et cetera. And how do you do that? Well, if the bank really didn't, wasn't going to liquidate their own balance sheet and was going to go to the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve would you know, give them some penalty rate of interest and give them a loan. And then that loan was based on high quality collateral. And that's it. Right. That was the role of the central bank. So the FOMC has totally lost their way, should not be sitting there with a bunch of PhDs trying to micromanage like a financing ministry. They should really be filled with, let's go back to its original purpose and then come up with some good bank examiners who can, you know, look at the quality collateral that's coming in. And that's it. Right. It's a discount window. But it's interesting that you bring that up because I was such an ardent opponent of the repeal of Glass-Steagall. I mean, I, I had a, a letter published in the uh, FT in 2002, after, right after it passed, and I actually had a discussion with with people who were instrumental in its passage. I go, it's a gigantic mistake, and the mistake, and as you touch, you know, because it forced me to read uh, Carter Glass's uh, Biography, autobiography or biography, which was quite interesting because, of course, he was so instrumental in the um, uh, right. 1913 uh, Federal Reserve Act. He was one of the mainstays. He was, and and he was a very smart uh, Virginia banker and had a lot of wisdom in what they were proposing. But when I say to people, I say, you understand, you okay, if you wanted to reappeal Glass-Steagall, which to me created the 2007, 2008 problem anyway, um, then you needed to repeal FDIC insurance. Because if you opted out of uh, what Glass-Steagall prevented, then you can't have FDIC insurance. Because most people don't realize that FDIC insurance was passed on the same day that Glass-Steagall was was approved. So they were one and the same. Because without that, you were... You were, as I said in the letter to the FT, uh, you were socializing the risk while you were privatizing the rewards. It was a mistake of gigantic proportion. And uh, I'm not in favor of what they just did in rolling back some of the Volcker uh, uh, restrictions. Terrible, terrible decision. And, you know, again, some regulations are good. And if you you have regulation, maybe you have good regulation, because bad regulation only harms those who need it the least. Um, so you know, that's, earlier, that's, uh, yeah, I agree with you. You know, earlier, uh, one of you mentioned, um, about the social and political ramifications of, of the fed and, and, and how it's wide reaching and, and maybe I'm reaching a little bit, but you, you talk about socialized, um, um, costs and, and privatized profits. And that was, you know, part of the uproar over bailing out the banks to the 2008 crisis, right? When you do it that way, they get to keep their profits, but the taxpayers on the hook for losses, um, people were outraged. But the, the whole Fed policy kind of rewards rich people, right? You also touched on inequality earlier in this conversation. And, you know, they're looking for inflation. Yeah, well, there's hyperinflation. It just happens to be in asset prices. Who owns asset prices? Rich people own asset prices, a vast majority of them. 
that's fine. If the whole pie is growing bigger, great. Then everybody is probably getting a little bit wealthier and prosperous. Now, the wealth and the quality may widen because the rich get richer at a faster pace. And that's fine as long as you're dragging the people up and they're being rewarded for being productive in society and everything. But the Fed would never admit that they're creating this type of inequality. And so there's a, there is a good argument that should be had on the difference between what Fed policy is doing for Wall Street versus Main Street. And certainly think about the, you know, and, and this is where some people say, and I've taken it a little too far, and that's fine. I, I understand it. But think about what happens in globalization when a lot of jobs were outsourced overseas. Okay. Well, you got it, the industrial belt of America as we moved to a services society from a, from a manufacturing society. But the problem with it is, is we never did anything to retrain those people in our factories. And so there's a hollowing out of uh, the rust belt in, in Ohio and in Michigan and Pennsylvania. And these people, when they had nowhere to go and nothing to do, you know, there are some of them that turn to, you know, opio, opio, opioid a- addiction and other things. But what happened is when every day you see the stock market and the bond market going up and the rich get richer, when you're in that middle part of the country, you feel as if your politicians are failing you. And, well, why is everyone getting rich? And I'm sitting here without training or a job. And part of that, and, you know, this may be a little bit of a reach, I do blame the Federal Reserve for the fact of of this kind of wealth inequality because they shouldn't be saying we're the only game in town, you know, and so but they have, you know, and and it's and it's kind of silly to think that with the only tool of, of manipulating the price of money, interest rates, that it can lead to full employment. I wrote an article called The H Curve. And the H stands for hubris. And basically what it says is that Fed policy to a certain level becomes counterproductive. In other words, when they cut interest rates below a certain level, what happens is it forces savers to save more. And all of the things they're trying to do can become counterproductive. And I really believe that is the case. Part of it is this kind of wealth inequality, the savers, the moral hazard issues that we've talked about. Well, yeah, you know, classically, as you talk, is the paradox of thrift, which Keynes warned about. And and I think back to when Bernanke and Yellen would come under uh, questioning about that very point that you're making, Guy. The response was, I thought, that, like they were speaking to kindergartners, and they basically said to the savers, Stop crying. Your home is going up in value. Your stock portfolio, and this, I'm, I'm quoting, I'm not, I'm not making this up. This is what they said. Your portfolio is going up in value. Your grandchildren have jobs. Your children have jobs. Uh, wh- what else do you want? And I thought it was, wow. I said, you got to do better than this. this is, and, and yet they both went down that path as to justify the, um, the, the policies that, that they embarked upon, and I, I think it did terrible harm. And 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 I and I and I will say this: as bad as the American worker, and I'm not talking again public sector; I'm talking private sector, was put upon by globalization. I ask people this question: I said, bond prices are going up. Who's buying bonds? I said, I'm telling you right now, it's the pension funds who are the biggest buyers of bonds. So when this all starts to unravel, and unravel it will, whether it's through debt repudiation, through the printing press, or just interest rates going higher and bond prices getting smashed, which will be its own worst outcome, it's the pension funds that are going to pay a price. So the workers are going to get, you know, those with pensions that are not all classified as workers per se, but those with pensions are going to get crushed on that way down. And in Europe, it's going to be even worse. So when when everybody applauds everything that's done, I go, you know, you know, it's again, it's not so fast, because you, you have to think through this. And if you and I and I challenge everybody when I talk to them, I go to trading rooms and have uh, discourse with people. Tell me what you think the exit strategy is. 
And I, and I challenged Bernanke in 2009. What's your exit strategy? Tell me how this ends. How do you get out of this? And he, you know, his attitude was, well, after QE1, which was fine and necessary, we'll just let them all roll off. I said, okay, until he embarked on QE2, QE3, <laughs> which was QE to infinity, then, then it became too big. Yeah. You know, had he stopped at one, we'd be in a different place. But the guy, you know, that hubris, that's exactly right. So, And you know what? I think people um, are not talking enough about the pension situation and what it does. So, you know, the average pension is 73% funded, you know, at this point. Um, with asset prices being where they are, you're right. What is that going to look like when interest rates, you know, if and when interest rates rise? And the other thing is they're doing it all um, under the incentive to try to create inflation. But again, I go back to why is inflation such a good thing? Well, you know, um, William McChesney Martin, the longest serving Fed governor, uh, chairman ever said you can never regain the purchasing power of the dollar once lost. So mm-hmm. if you cut your purchasing power in half in 13 in 36 years by having 2% inflation, why is that such a good thing? And in terms of wealth inequality, what is a poor person's biggest asset? Well, it's not the stocks and the bonds that they're putting into a bubble. The poor person's biggest asset is cash. So their yeah. purchasing power, they feel that purchasing power is a percentage of their disposable income uh, at a much more magnified level. And, and, and what do they want to do? They want to wipe out cash with electronic money. So only for the sole purpose And people who argue with me, like, and I'm not a conspiratorial person. This is just, if you listen to them, they're telling it to you so that they can go to negative interest rates because negative interest rates don't work as long as we have cash. No, it's it, well. I don't know if they'll if they'll ever work. Um, and then in the, you know, it, I don't know if you can go to the negative nominal rates in the United States and destroy the money market industry. But what's right. interesting is this Carney. You bring, you make me think of the Carney <laughs> comment the <laughs> other day, yeah. which is so yeah, fascinating because the U.S. is twenty percent. Our GDP is twenty percent of global GDP. Yet fifty percent of trades, global trade is invoiced in U.S. dollars. So we play this sort of outsized role. And I guess maybe we should. The U.S. is more stable. It's the biggest economy. It's the world's reserve currency. But one of the things that he talked about was having um, some type of uh, a consortium among commercial banks and central banks to have what I think he called the synthetic hegemonic uh, currency you know, whether it's SDR or gold or whatever, so that international trade can be priced in something other than the dollar. And we talked about what would happen if Trump would devalue the dollar. Well, I'll throw it out there. What would happen if all of a sudden, um, you know, you're not going to replace the dollar as the world's reserve sort of currency anytime soon or immediately, but you start putting together a another type of settlement and clearing mechanism for global trade that is not based strictly in U.S. dollars, all of a sudden the influence starts to uh, ratchet lower a little bit so that then the demand of dollars will fall. What will that do to, you know, bubble everywhere U.S. dollar-backed assets? Uh, I just raised that at this point. I find it fascinating. No, it's it's and it's a great point. And yes, he did he did raise that. And yes, it's a serious issue that exists out there. But hey, we may as well have the uh, the Libra because that's where he was going. But uh, you know, Mark Carney should have stayed in Canada. He did a nice job when he ran the Bank of Canada. After that, I think he uh, he punched away uh, way too far above his weight. But that's just my opinion. Uh, and now he's looking for a new spot in the uh, in the realm of uh, the global banking hierarchy. So, uh, effectively, he was bypassed for the IMF's uh, directorship. He's searching for something else, and that's what I thought that piece was about. I mean, there was really nothing new in it, uh, but the fact that he gave it voice. Okay, I long for Mervyn King. So that's all I can say about that. Um, 
Great, and um, just given as, as the last question, given all these risks and trends, what are the implications for investments in the financial markets, Guy? Yeah, um, let me just say about the, the Fed, I think it's what they're doing, and, and I blame the Fed even more than other central banks because they are the holder of the world's reserve currency. So when they went to zero, everyone else had to go to zero to stop their currency from appreciating so much. So the Fed started it, the Fed has to stop it. And I think what they've done already is the greatest tragedy of our time. And it, and this strategy, tragedy is hiding in plain sight. And they've, uh, you know, they've made, they, they've made it worse by creating the moral hazard we discussed, by offering up the market put, that we've discussed that has uh, fueled a psychology of bullishness that is uh, making people too complacent. So it's like a Minsky moment. And it can be disrupted very, very quickly by some of the things I spoke about, whether it's this anti-globalization push through currency wars, whether it's this new, you know, a new standard that takes place for pricing things in some you know, new synthetic currency. But what should investors do is I, I think they're foolish to keep saying, oh, just go into the index of the benchmarks because markets always go up. Uh, they're trying to beat their peers and their benchmarks. It just shows a blatant disregard for valuations, for sizing appropriately. There's no fiduciary standards in that. I think portfolio can, you know, modern portfolio theory no longer works as because in a digital world, it's not normally distributed. Think about it this way. It's, we're in a winner take all environment. Think about the things, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, that's responsible for about half of the returns over the last one, three, five years. And so why would you want a market average when we're in a winner take all type of environment? And I think that the skew in terms of upside potential versus downside risk um, has, is, is really being miscalculated by many, many portfolio uh, managers and certainly by IRAs who just are, you know, want to tell their clients, you know, never market time, stay in the market. It's the only way to make money. But I would say, well, at this point, with the low ammunition that we have, both in terms of fiscal and monetary policy, you know, a serious correction means, you know, we could have a 30, 40 percent correction. And it's going to take you decades to get back to your high water mark. So then the question becomes, so what do you do? And I think you have to find non-correlated sources of idiosyncratic risk, meaning non-correlated to just stocks and bonds that you can only make money when they go up in price. Well, both of them are in kind of bubblish type of pricing and that both of them have become correlated so that they do not have that 60-40 type portfolio. I wrote a paper about that recently. They do not have the characteristics that act as a good balanced portfolio. So there are plenty of good alternative strategies where 20 years ago, some of these alternatives were not investable alternatives. And today they actually are. But rather than long only equity, you could go into equity neutral funds or long short equity funds. There's um, activist funds, special situations, direct lending, peer-to-peer -peer lending, and then real alternatives, like find a way to own some type of real assets, whether it's like timber or some real estate that gives you some stream of income, um, things like that. You're going to need to be much, much more creative. Uh, and that's what I think investors need to be cognizant of, that these risks are are really, really significantly uh, a high, and they should focus on a better portfolio construction. And Ira, your final thoughts? Well, uh, to put together, you know, because I'm I'm a trader, I trade a lot of futures contracts because um, that's where my leverage is. And even though I think all these long-term things, I trade in between all my thought processes because. 
That's just what I've done for as long as I've done. But it doesn't mean that I can't see uh, exactly what Guy's talking about. And he's right. And uh, when he says timber and things of real asset value, you know, I, I've been a big proponent of gold. And as, you know, the, from the um, pejorative uh, people, I'll get, oh, you're a gold bug. And I go, no, I'm nothing of the sort. But can I call you a fiat currency bug? Because if you're going to be pejorative to me, I, I can fire back. Because if you're not, if you don't believe in hard assets, uh, such as gold, silver, platinum, um, timber, uh, listen, some, some equities are hard assets. Because if they're businesses, and even hard times are coming, but they, they manufacture things and there's real capital behind it, meaning, you know, the uh, manufacturing capital, those are worth worth owning because economies just don't go upside down like that. So you have to seek out that which you believe will sustain itself and will will generate enough of a return to get you through some of the worst of the times. And then again, those are real assets that will come with it and, and avoid debt. I, do, I avoid debt like the plague. You know, I know that there's good debt, but companies that take on debt to do share buybacks, to issue dividends, to uh, uh, basically they do share buybacks because they're busy buying in stock uh, from the options so that they're, it's not dilutive. And, and all they're doing is passing it off. Uh, I don't know why people are so enamored with that. Um, so I, I avoid companies with, with debt. So I look for things that have, you know, great potential and where there's value. Uh, you know, I, I believe that Mexico, even with AMLO and their politics a little bit strained, will come out at some point looking very, very good because they have a growing population and a su- supremely, severely undervalued currency. If you want to talk about currency wars, the Mexican peso sits in a very uh, great position once the, the trade uh, war uh, starts to calm down because I think Mexico. So I look at thing. Canada is loaded with good companies with real assets. Uh, so yeah, you have to be global. You have to think global. Until the only thing that global people have to fear is any kind of sense of uh, capital controls. We haven't had those in a long time. Uh, I mean, they were experimented with by Malaysia under Mahathir Mohamed in this in the 19, late 1990s during the Asian contrasion crisis. But we have not really seen capital controls. So as long as capital control freely, you can find uh, situations. But uh, until I see some type of exit strategy from the central banks, I I believe in uh, gold against the currencies. That doesn't mean it won't have severe corrections. It will. And that's why I stay nimble and I trade and I look for levels of, uh, I look for low risk entries of, of, of where I can uh, put on trades at low risk and I can get you know, nice upside, and then the, when they get overextended or parabolic rises, I would I sell them. And if I was long bonds, which I'm not, I'm long two years and less, but I would be selling bonds because you want to talk about parabolic uh, patterns of, of price increases, bonds are certainly in that. So I would be getting rid of my bonds. Yeah, they can go up higher, but do I want to be part of them? Not, not not for a second. So uh, that's what I'd be looking to do. I I, I want to get away from anything that smells of debt because it's not going to be a, a very good outcome. Well, great, great insight. Gentlemen, how, how can our listeners learn more about uh, your work, Guy? Um, well, uh, I post a lot of what I've been writing lately on LinkedIn. I would reach them. I would encourage them to reach out to me either directly or follow some of my work there. Uh, I'm thinking about posting it in other areas, but that's to be announced. Thank you for asking that question. Great. And Ira? I'm where, I am where I am. Uh, still writing at uh, Notes from Underground. Um, and I'm doing, you know, I do these podcasts, which I think, you know, this is great. I'm glad I had to, to do this with Guy. I think there's a lot of stuff to be learned here. You may not find the trade that you want today, but if it keeps you from out of some trouble and doing some bad things, then it's even worth more. Uh, and just to be aware of the of the pratfalls. But I'm at Notes from Underground where 
most of my thought process winds up uh, in a blog. And again, the strength of the blog is only because of the discourse that takes place through the readership. So uh, those are all good things. Great. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We'll end it there. Thank you. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk.